Hello and welcome <clears> to <throat> another instalment of History Hack. Now, Merrin is here with me Hello. and I've never seen her so excited and hyperactive <laughs> in all my life. So tell me, woman, who is it that's wound you up into a frothing, horrible, bonkers mess? Uh, I'm sorry, he must have this <laughs> for women all the time. And that's why you're so keen to talk to him. Well, today's guest is an author who's absolute flair for storytelling, for exploration and insatiable curiosity for bringing the past into the present should be no surprise when you discover that his father, and I hope he doesn't mind me mentioning this. He doesn't. He was the director of the RGS, the Royal Geographic Society, for over 20 years. Now, I'm a fellow of the RGS myself, and I happen to have a copy, I think, of everything, everything, (laughs) and a very old book now, that our guest has ever written. I've got nom de code here, I've got got a lot, so I'm very excited, and it's it's a real privilege to actually be able to talk to you. Oh, thank you. Henry, Henry, thank you for being here. Thank you. It's an honour. I'm really pleased. Have you ever had quite such a, an experience of a woman throwing herself at you in a- <laughs> this is great it's telling me downhill from here this is, yeah, this yeah, is what i'm feeling like, in my in my really, bones really just if we can if we can cut here yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so I, I first got to know you as an author because i picked a copy of um of churchill's iceman about jeffrey pike the 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 i mean he earned a reputation as one of the second world war's most eccentric and innovative um, contributors behind the scenes. But the man we're going to talk about today is the subject of your most recent epic, Our Man in New York, which is a title that will remind readers mm. of perhaps John Le Carre's um, spy novel title, Our Man in Panama, and with good reason. Do you want to start off by giving us a little bit of background about William Bill Stevenson, who he was, where he came from, wh- mm. where he worked, and no spoilers, but <laughs> how he came to the attention of MI6. I would, I would love to. It's, um, and yeah, just again, it's great to be on this. Bill Stevenson is, um, exactly as you say, in 1940, he was the, he was the MI6 head of station in America. So he was in charge of all MI6 operations over in the US. And immediately, I mean, even just sort of hearing myself say that, you think, public school educated, um, comfortably off someone possibly with a military or naval background, and also probably a career spy, or at least a career diplomat. And in almost every possible way, Bill Stevenson is the opposite. He is someone who grew up in a remote part of, of Canada in Winnipeg, and he came from a working class Icelandic family. He was um, effectively orphaned by the age of three he grew up in the street next to the red light district of Winnipeg. He had a tough childhood. His, um, his dad died when he was three. His mum abandoned him when he was four and went off with his two siblings. So he went to go and um, was taken in by a neighbour. And he then metamorphoses. He, he goes to London after the First World War. He has a, a good First World War, as in he becomes a pilot. He has about a year of being a pilot. And a new part of him comes out. And so up until then, he's been this, I mean, I don't want to be a kind of <laughs> a poor man psychologist, but understandably, given his childhood, he was known as a very quiet teenager and someone who had just, yeah, he, he couldn't get everything out. He's really into boxing, but that was about it. Mm-hmm. But then in a plane over the Western Front, this different part of him comes out. He comes alive. He becomes heroic. He wins medals. He goes back to Canada, a hero, and immediately goes off to London to to start afresh. And the amazing thing about when he turns up in London is that he never talks about his past. He says that he came from a a well-to-do family in Canada, but that's it. And you can't get anything more out of him. So he's, he's covering up his past. He throws himself into business. He becomes a self-made millionaire, which in the 1920s is saying something. He's, I mean, he's, he's a sort of, yeah, in modern terms, he's a tech entrepreneur. So he's into radio. Radio at that time is the kind of the, the newest and sexiest technology. And he is selling radio sets and delivering, he has a, a franchise for radio news. And he does really well at it. He's driven. And during the 1930s, he then begins to expand his wealth. He has holdings in different companies all over the place. And 
it's around about this time that because he has holdings and companies all over Europe, that he always wants to get an edge, he develops this network of friends or business contacts who will tell him what's going on in countries like Sweden, Norway, and indeed Germany during the 1930s, and then come back to him and tell him exactly what, what they saw. And this is so he kind of, he can get ahead of his, his rival investors and competitors on the stock market. But what he's done is he's informally set up this intelligence network. It's business intelligence. But as the 1930s rolls on, increasingly politics comes into it. And by the end of the 1930s, he has this actually quite useful intelligence network that can give a pretty good picture of some of the things going on in countries like Germany, which weren't being reported in the papers. And what he does in about 1939 is he tries to bring this to the attention of MI6. Okay. And I'm always, I mean, like, like any author, I'm always, when you realize who the kind of the, the star character in your book is, you're always trying to, to get some kind of psychological in, some kind of, you're looking for any kind of flaw or, or sort of um, any clue as to who he really is and what he's trying to achieve that's not there in, in terms of what we know about him ordinarily. And I'm really interested by this bit of his history. Why does he go to MI6? Why is he so desperate to get this the attention of this, this secret establishment club? And I think it's about belonging. I think it's about him desperately wanting to be a part of this, as I say, establishment group that no one really knows anything about and is secretive and, and you want to be a part of. And he, because he tries really hard and MI6 keep telling him to get lost, effectively. <laughs> and then finally, in literally the summer of 1939, so we are weeks away from the outbreak of the Second World War, the head of MI6 says, okay, we'll take on your intelligence network for free. And, um, and Bill Stevenson, the self-made millionaire from Canada, is thrilled. He is, um, he's finally, he wanted something beyond wealth in his life, and to an extent he's achieved this. He feels appreciated. He feels part of something. Exactly. Yeah. And, um, and then nine months later, without giving too much away, he is sent over to America to run the MI6 operation there with zero experience of doing anything like this. No training, nothing like that. So, so this is 1949. And, mm. and if I'm right, I mean, this is when Britain has decided one of the best ways to garner support is to sway US public opinion if it can. And for that to work, then they need connections and engagement at the highest possible level. So at at the other end of the spectrum, that means marketing, propaganda, really integrating into, into the psyche as much as possible with the US, the, the US population. What is Bill's role when he's, I mean, he's sent there, but what is his actual role? His role as head of station, it changes according to basically what he's told to do by London. So C, the head of MI6 in London, will give him general instructions as to what to do. And... There's something almost tragic about the first few months of Bill Stevenson being in America, where he keeps having these bright ideas, and he sends them over to London and gets these withering replies, saying, you know, well, I think this, this gentleman isn't able to express himself, and this idea is um, patently unable to succeed, and so on. And, and maybe there's a tiny bit of jealousy there, some of these uh, career MI6 officers just um, shooting down his ideas. But to begin with, he keeps coming up with ideas which he thinks will help improve Britain's reputation in America, help to sway American public opinion, which is the most important thing that Britain strategically at that point can possibly do. And he keeps being shot down. And this continues. He, uh, he has an ally in the British ambassador, Lord Lothian. Lord Lothian then in late 1940 dies partly as a result of his, his Christian science. So he, he gets an infection which is eminently treatable, but because of his religious beliefs, doesn't have it treated. And mm. therefore, Britain loses this, um, this incredibly talented and important ambassador. And it also leaves Bill Stevenson, to a small extent, without his mentor figure. So Lothian had really sort of, he was teaching him a lot. He was giving a, him a good understanding of how to operate in this new and quite unusual world of, uh, of being an MI6 officer in America. And so there he is. His, his overall objective is to try and change American public opinion, 
No one really knows how to do this. And there comes a moment in early 1941 where Bill Stevenson takes this really quite radical decision where he decides he's, he's effectively going to launch his own offensive against the Americans who are trying to say we should keep out of the war. And he does not have the backing of London. He does not go to sea first and say, hey, I've got this great idea. We could infiltrate a whole series of groups. We could uh, get spies inside the Gallup organization. We he could start fights have... outside, talks and so on. He does have a formidable ally, though, doesn't he? He does. He's got a wonderful ally. And to be honest, slightly annoyingly from a writer's point of view, this ally has the same first name as Stevenson. It's another bill. <laughs> it's another Bill, and this guy's called, uh, his nickname is Wild Bill. And uh, this is Wild Bill Donovan, and he is a crucial part of this story. This is, um, I mean, again, when you're sniffing around for new stories, it's, you, you want a strong character at the heart of it. But even better is when there's a really interesting relationship at mm. the heart <laughs> of a story. Does and you never quite allies? know who's in charge. Does he have allies and relationships as well with the American government? Well, with the American intelligence services? Not with the established American intelligence services, no. So his plan, which if you sort of think about it historically, I mean, at the time when he came up with the plan, it was mad. But his plan in 1940 was to just really sort of become friends with Wild Bill Donovan, to make Wild Bill Donovan believe that he, Donovan, could set up a brand new intelligence agency and this brand new intelligence agency would be supported by the Brits and it would help to push America into the war but, because he knew that the other ones weren't really going to do that. So the FBI doesn't exist yet, does it? It does. Oh, and it the does. FBI, the FBI, to begin with, is, is just about able to tolerate the idea of Bill Stevenson, this MI6 guy, yeah. running around trying to change opinion. But it's pretty um, new, isn't it? But how does he get on with Hoover? To begin with, really well. But yeah. then the relationship rapidly goes south. <laughs> and, uh... That doesn't sound like J. Edgar Hoover. <laughs> <laughs> and then Hoover is absolutely out to get him. And there are these these moments which... Yeah, to be honest, in the 21st century, just feel really, really hard to believe. But they can't actually work out where in New York he's running his operation from. So you have the FBI that tries for weeks to actually work out where in New York Bill Simpson has this office with several hundred people pumping out fake news. And as it turns out, it's in the Rockefeller Center. I mean, you think it'd be quite easy to find. Oh, that's brilliant. So one of the biggest buildings in Manhattan. Yeah. Like, right. <laughs> and, and that's... <laughs> That's got to be some building, hasn't it? He's got to have quite a lavish setup there. Yeah. It's huge and it's um, well, state of the art. Deco and... and I love the stories of the, um, so about half of the population of this, this really quite large office by the end of it. So by the end of 41, there's about a thousand people working there. And roughly half of them are secretaries and most of them are Canadians. And I love all the kind of recollections when they were interviewed many years later of, of, them talking about being in the lift and making sure not to kind of talk about what they were doing and making sure nobody else in the building had any idea what they were really up to and how they were even, they were all, they lived in an apartment block about sort of half a mile away. They'd be bussed in and this system worked. So they were hermetically sealed off from New York society and no one found out what they were up to and exactly what they were doing, which as I say, for an office of about a thousand people, is um, is remarkable. It is. It is. It really, really is. So he's he's developing a propaganda network, isn't mm, he? Mm. To sway public opinion and garner support from the US for for our endeavours here. Yes. He had a a fairly topical approach, though, did, didn't he, as to how he created this sway of opinion? Mm. The, I mean, if if I understand right, he was encouraging politicians to make broadcasts is that right yes he okay. was indeed somewhat mythical nazi fifth column um, <laughs> he i think he forged a letter revealing plans for a nazi coup in bolivia and um, wasn't there a german map of south america reorganized as hitler intended that yeah there was i and, loved um, it i mean basically he, he becomes it becomes madder and more daring the, the further they go and I love it. And from about kind of the summer of 1941, this is when you're hitting sort of peak 
British fake news in America. Mm-hmm. And you've got Ian Fleming as part of this office briefly. Roald Dahl is one of the people out there. The later known as the father of advertising, David Ogilvy. He's one of the people also yeah. involved. And they're all dreaming up these, um, these stories. They're inventing imaginary commando raids on the north coast of France. The guy who invented Bond is making crap up to fool the Americans. <laughs> it's brilliant. It's, and he was, um, he was obsessed with Stevenson. He wrote all sorts of things about Bill Stevenson. He claimed that Stevenson was one of the inspirations for James Bond. I mean, admittedly, there's a list as long as my arm of people yeah. who <laughs> described as that. But still, the, the one thing for all Bond fans that is worth adding is that um, in one of Ian Fleming's notes, he describes how Bill Stevenson likes to make his martinis. And no. you'll never guess. <laughs> a weak-ass martini that's shaken and not stirred. And therefore, not stirred. Yeah. No one else you know that that makes it weak, right? Yeah. <laughs> a real man would have it stirred, not shaken, is all I'm saying. Yeah. Well, it's rule me out as being a real man. Good. I remember having one of these once, and it was... <laughs> Was, yeah, I can't it was drink stronger than I still. was planning. But uh, <laughs> but yes, yeah, so Ian Fleming is uh, he's he's taken by Bill Stevenson, and they are pumping out fake news. I mean, there are two things to talk about here. One is coming up with the stories, coming up with ideas which are you know mad enough to be to actually have some kind of impact on public opinion, but not so mad that no one's going to believe them. Yeah. This is Machiavellian madmen, isn't it? It is, Can and what I like about it is you're doing it for a, a Nazi colony on the moon. There, how there's not much madder than that, <laughs> so it, you can pretty much go nuts, can't you? They, um, I mean, the, the the Nazi invasion of South America, which never was, and the map which they dreamed up to support it is my is my favourite bit of fake news, mainly because of just how far it went and where it ended up. So, I mean, one thing is coming up with the idea, another thing is. Where do you get it? How do you get it into a newspaper editor's hands and for him to believe it? How do you get it onto Roosevelt's desk in the Oval Office in such a way that he's willing to to make an entire speech about this piece of fake news that you've cooked up? And this uh, the map of South America is uh, is brilliant because it was uh, it was made by the, the the future director of light entertainment, the BBC. A guy called Eric uh, Eric Mashwitz, who is a brilliant screenwriter. He wrote uh, also various songs like "These Foolish Things," sung by Billie Holiday, or indeed "A Nightingale Sang in Berkeley Square," written by this amazing man. And when he he gets sent over to America, he gets put in charge of a um, a forgery unit over in in Canada. And this unit was was its brief was to be able to cook up any document that Stevenson wanted. Hmm. and the order comes through from one of Ian Fleming's best friends, a guy called Ivor Bryce, to, um, to create this, this fictional map of South America, showing what it would look like after a Nazi invasion. Oh. So all of the, uh, the boundaries are redrawn. They even had little Lufthansa roots showing how the Germans <laughs> would go about. And, uh, and they tried to redraw... It's a all fun of war, them. isn't it? <laughs> it's sort of almost hard to kind of associate with the reality of the yeah. world, world taking place on the other side of the world. And this extraordinary map, it's the thing that kind of gives it verisimilitude is, uh, is Eric Mashwitz, screenwriter extraordinaire, has the idea of writing in German, just scribbling in the margins. The, the sort of, I can't do, I don't know the German words, but um, the equivalent of this map is not what I asked for. You got this, this and this wrong. Get it right next time. And that, as if he were a kind of annoyed German civil servant who's yeah. trying to get it right. There's um, a phenomenal amount of work going into this, clearly. Mm. Um, for Stevenson, is building momentum, and it's clearly directed all one way, but it doesn't all go their way, does it? Uh, he does have dissenters, and he does have an opponent, uh, because it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be this story if it wasn't someone instantly recognisable to everybody. So he, he, Charles Lindbergh has beef with him. Uh, yeah. who we all know as a transatlantic flyer, um, and I hadn't realised, was an isolationist. Uh, isol- isolationist, got it? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so he adamantly, obviously, is against everything that Stevenson stands for in, in respect of the war. He is, and, um, and he's, and funny enough, well, not funny at all, but he, this sort of part of his life is not one that many people know about. 
He was Charles Lindbergh at the time, late 1930s, one of the most famous men alive. He was a, a celebrity on a sort of different level to almost any other celebrity you can think of. And his life had become really difficult in America, partly because of the, the death of his firstborn son. His firstborn son had been kidnapped. And this at the time was he felt and his wife felt a result of this, of the paparazzi, of the, the media scrutiny they were under, that he was such a high profile figure that there were people who wanted to kidnap his son. And, um, and so he moves to Europe. He, he says, actually, I'm going to just put it all behind me. I want nothing to do with celebrity, fame, the media, anything like that. And then suddenly he reappears. He turns up back in America in 1939. Sounds familiar. I don't want anyone paying attention <laughs> Leave me alone. No, wait. I'm in Suddenly, America. Um, give me that microphone. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, and, and then cool. <laughs> from that moment, nobody could, could shut him up. And it's, it's a tragic story in some ways because he goes into this for, I think, all the right reasons. He goes into it because he does not want America to come into a war, which, which hasn't yet started. And he believes, and again, he's absolutely right, that Hitler does not pose a military threat to the United States in 1940, and it doesn't at that time. But the further he goes, and the more pressure he's under, and the more Germans sent by the German embassy he's surrounded by, so the German embassy is thrilled by this and, and try to kind of put ideas in his mind, basically the more anti-immigration and the more anti-Semitic he becomes. Oh. And he's, I mean, thank God from a historical point of view, he, he kept a really detailed diary. And I've read the whole thing during this period. And it's just, it is tragic seeing this sort of slow decline. And this, uh, and he falls into just seeing, seeing Jewish plots everywhere he looks. He gives a talk in the summer of 1941 and he gets sweaty. The air conditioning he, he thinks is not working as it should. And there's this moment in his diary where he says this is almost certainly another Jewish plot. And I was like, that's kind of, <laughs> that's the moment. That's the moment where you kind of, you really are imagining that's things everywhere good. you look. It's yuck, good. isn't it? And like you say, yeah. you someone decline like that. Yeah, because he, he goes, and he is, there is a gullibility to him. There is a naivety to him. He is being hoodwinked by the Germans in the late 1930s, when he was given tours of Nazi Germany, again, he was used by the Germans who understood how they could feed him certain lines, and he would pass them off as if they were accurate. So, yeah, he is he's both a victim as well as someone who succumbs to something that I think was very deep inside him. But there is this, this to me, sort of quite moving moment in terms of just how you think about America and, and American public opinion where he gives, his speeches are becoming just increasingly more, more anti-Semitic. And most of the time he's dog whistling. He's making these, he's just sort of allowing his supporters to read between the lines and to, to get the gist of what he's saying. And then some of the people who surrounded him say, look, you've just got to come out with it. You've got to just say what you feel. And this is what you think you should feel. And on the September the 11th, 1941, he gives this, this infamous speech where he finally says... I believe America is being drawn into the war by a conspiracy, a Jewish plot. And, um, and, and at that moment, America sort of has to decide, do we just tolerate this? Do we accept it? Or do we turn completely against him? And collectively, they decide to turn massively against him. He becomes this pariah figure. And, um, and suddenly nobody wants to hear him speak. And there's even, they're sort of just thinking of sort of British interventions which go wrong there's a moment quite soon after the speech where bill stevenson's team had this um they've, they've had this brilliant idea because they know that Lindbergh usually when he gives a talk there's a massive crowd tens of thousands of people and they have this idea where they're going to create counterfeit tickets to his next event and they're going to just hand these out for free on the streets of new york the idea being you'd have two people trying to sit down in every single seat which of course would create chaos and mm. this talk wouldn't be able to go ahead and so they put this cunning plan into uh, <laughs> into effect and because so few people actually want to go and see Lindbergh by this stage because of the speech it's just given they actually hand out free tickets to a whole lot of people who come along who wouldn't have gone anyway and so they actually boost the audience <laughs> at this talk yeah which um they only do once and um after that 
audiences dwindle off rapidly. But they're not the only ones, are they, playing the, oh, let's see how we can manipulate propaganda game? Because is it Thompson at the German embassy? It is, yeah. use envelopes, is that right? Yeah, he, again, he's the sort of the main adversary of, of Bill Stevenson. He's the German charge d'affaires, the, the leading German diplomat. And he's running his own influence campaign. He's doing everything he can to try and keep America out of the war. And he has vast resources. To Germany, this is as important as it is to Britain for opposite reasons. Mm. And he is, as you say, he, he's managed to, uh, to set up this scheme, a scheme which, which allows him to, to use something called the Congressional Frank. And um, I mean, to sum it all up, it's, it gets quite detailed. It's... Basically, he has the support of American congressmen to send out Nazi propaganda for free, or rather at the expense of the US taxpayer. And this, I mean, on the face of it, this, there's something remarkable about this, that you have, you've got at least 10 or 15 serving congressmen who are really, who are consciously working with the German embassy, consciously helping them to distribute Nazi propaganda around the United States in the months leading up to Pearl Harbor. And understandably, that's not part of that's not only the American history syllabus. That's not something that is, um, is part of the, the more mythical version of how America comes into the war. But it was a part of the reality of 1941. And this was one of the things that Stevenson was, uh, was up against. So, so just to explain, the, the congressman, if, if an envelope goes out in a congressman's name, the American taxpayer effectively foots the bill, don't they? So yeah, exactly. when, when the German embassy manages to orchestrate this campaign, this propaganda mm. campaign, they're actually getting the American government to foot the bill for Nazi propaganda. That's me. <laughs> hey, well, I just, I cannot believe they would be anything other than shit hot at propaganda oh, in America after the Zimmerman telegram and the balls up in World War I I cannot believe that <laughs> Germany would not be totally on point and efficient and on top of their propaganda game in the US is that how it is? It was they, were, they put a lot of effort into it but they were not as ingenious as the British they didn't get people inside <laughs> For those who are not watching at home, there was a good. Yeah, I just fist bumped. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they were one over on the Nazis is always uh, a good thing. I mean, how to sort of sum it up? It was there was a lot of it was A for effort, but it was it was sort of D for ingenuity. Mm-hmm. As in, they put a lot of money into trying to get a particular story into the newspapers, but but it wouldn't be at the right time, and they wouldn't do it with enough sophistication that the the, the story was plausible. And a bit heavy-handed as well. A little bit heavy-handed, a bit a too subtle. direct. I yeah. meanwhile, over on the kind of the British side, there's um, it becomes more Machiavellian, to use mm. that word, more yeah. sophisticated. And it's I mean, it's a funny one. This the the morality of it, because a lot of the stuff the British were doing in twenty sorry in nineteen forty and nineteen forty one is is similar in an abstract sense to what the Russians were alleged to have done in 2016 mm-hmm. and a lot of the techniques uh it's it's yeah it's the same kind of thing that's also used by organizations like well cambridge analytica during its lifetime and it's sophisticated it's based on three basic principles i'm always wary of sort of trying to give a guide for how to produce fake news but if you were to do it <laughs> this would be this would be <laughs> the the, uh, the mantra highlights are fine <laughs> Um, you need to make sure the story is coming from a variety of different sources. Number one, if it's, if it's just coming from one place, it doesn't feel believable. Number two, it has to be slightly different from each of these places. Number three, you've got to make sure that these are people, these are sources that you trust. And so the question is how to get slightly different versions of the same story to a series of different sources that are trustworthy at about the same time. Mm-hmm. And then beyond that, there was something else which I thought was really good and interesting was their understanding of timing. Mm. So they'd never just get the whole story out at once. They'd get part of the story out and hold bits back. And once the fire, if you like, once the blaze had started, then they'd feed in more because they understood that the best kind of story is one which, which grows, which builds every day. 
And if it can last for, say, four or five days, fantastic. That's going to yeah. really stay in people's imagination. It fuels and, itself at some point. Exactly. And then people start reporting even on the reporting and, mm. uh, and governments start complaining about the reporting. And then it's got, as you say, a momentum of its own. And, uh, and so it was impressively sophisticated. And most of the people doing this were not people who had media training. Yes, quite a few of them were journalists. But yes, a lot of them were screenwriters or composers or businessmen or people who brought an array of different skills to this particular problem. And that, I think, is what gave it that level of sophistication. You have someone like David Ogilvy, who's... Um, his experience up until then is is selling Argus, going door to door selling Argus, um, as well as someone like Bill Stevenson, who is at his happiest selling stocks and shares. But they come together with a whole series of other people. They've got an enormous drive to succeed. They've also got pressure, as in they know that if they don't succeed and they don't get some kind of change soon, then Britain will be in trouble. And this creates a perfect storm in which they, they very, very rapidly develop this extremely sophisticated fake news operation. And for anybody who doesn't know, David Ogilvy is the guy behind the, for example, Rolls Royces, The Only Thing You Can Hear Is The Clock campaign. <laughs> when, it's just a, a mild digression. When that ad campaign went into Rolls Royce, the only comment, the only feedback they gave Ogilvy was, got to do something about that clock, haven't we? He is still revered <laughs> as a creative genius and, and his framework against which creativity can um, fuel itself is, is legendary. It's absolutely, I've got his, I've got a couple of his books on the, on the wall over there. Yeah. H- Henry, when we talk about the, the network that Stevenson set up, it's clear that he, he it's not so much that he's, an exemplar of how to do it, but he's become a legend in his own lunch break by virtue of the fact that it's, it's almost intuitive the way he's working. Mm. And his reputation didn't precede him, but it certainly succeeded him, didn't it? Because mm. yours is not the first book about Bill's life, is it? It's not. There are other books. <laughs> but, mm. uh, but we don't I mean, want to buy any of them. We don't want to. We, I mean, all you need to know about the first, actually not the first, the, the, the best known book about Bill Stevenson is called A Man Called Intrepid. And all I can say is that it was, it was reclassified by its publisher as not a work of history, but a work of fiction. It was actually put into the, which for any biographer is, is, is a big oh. moment. It was a, um, a book written by a guy who, um, who, who once said to Nigel West, um, if I'd known how well this book was going to do, I wouldn't have made up so much of it. He um he just he, he went to town. He had he created Stevenson as this sort of mythical figure who was running um, Allied intelligence around the entire world, and as well as running intelligence in America, he was also helping to um, assassinate Nazis in Europe. And he was part of the Enigma project. And he was also stealing heavy water from Norway. And, this guy. Um, I mean, he might have been on on the beaches at D-Day as well. Who knows? But it was, he just sort of went with it and had a lot of fun and just made up a lot of stuff. But a lot of this stuck. And there is, and certainly in Canada, there is, um, there's even an intrepid society, which this takes as its sort of founding text, this particular book. And and although they, they appreciate that there are things in the book which are not true, it's, a case of a marriage of, of a kind of a man and a, and a desire in, in that nation at that time. And as someone who is um, part Canadian, I can, <laughs> I can relate to this, but he, he's, a, he's become a Canadian legend. Yeah. He's revered in his hometown of Winnipeg and elsewhere around the country. And he achieved a hell of a lot. And to me, that's one of the sadnesses that the yeah. reality of what he did was so amazing. There's, there's no need to, to burnish it in the way that... Uh, that this previous biographer did. It's overshadowed. It, his, yeah. his exploits, and they are exploits to some extent, are overshadowed by, by what came to bear, by, yes. by, by being characterised. It's like a caricature. I've, I've, I've read the book. Yeah. So when you were putting this together, I mean, MI6 as a rule don't release material willy-nilly. They're all kinds of gagging orders. They do not. 
<laughs> Henry's like, I have tried. <laughs> <laughs> Every day I knock on the door, but uh, yeah. They're like, oh God, it's him again. <laughs> and, and if anyone's going to be able to help you out, it's probably Nigel West. But if if Stevenson was reporting, I mean, there, there must have been reports. Were you able to access his original material? I mean, what information could, could you access to corroborate what was actually happening? So there's, um, MI6 doesn't release its own records, but um, a lot or almost all of the um, reports that Stevenson was sending to MI6 um, went through the Foreign Office and the Foreign Office has, some years ago, released a wonderful treasure trove of these oh. documents. So that was a big, big part of it. There's also wonderful footage from people like Roald Dahl sitting down, talking about their memories of him. So there's a large number of memoirs of people describing life with him. But also, the um, MI6 doesn't release its stuff, but SOE does. And this became a joint MI6 SOE operation. So I had a great time in the National Archives going through all of the SOE records for, for the United States. And SOE was, yeah, by, by Pearl Harbor, it was an increasingly large operation. They even had, as you remember from the book, two people who were sent over with the job of um, a political assassination, of which there's no more in the archives, just the fact that they were sent over with that job. Damn it. I do not know who they may have been planning to kill. I don't think they did kill anyone because there's later reference to their job being altered. But anyway, they were sent over with that brief Have your you got favorite suspicion? candidate you must like, no like that. <laughs> you've got an idea henry <laughs> i really do i wish i did honestly that would be that'd be the centerpiece of the book yeah. but um but it was it was fun sort of working out who these guys were and talking to their their descendants going off to meet them and um i didn't quite have the heart to tell them by the way your granddad was uh, <laughs> was sent off to america in order to become an assassin but it's all right because it didn't work out. But they, yeah, so they were, this sort of gives you a, an idea of just how far they were willing to go. So there is, there's a good range of material, which a lot of which has only become available in the last 10, mm -hmm. 15 years. And I guess one of the other things which brought me into this story is, um, is my granny, my Canadian granny, who had a similar-ish childhood in parts to uh, to bill stevenson she was actually living at one point as a child in winnipeg came I'm, from oh, my mind is still blown by the red light district in winnipeg <laughs> no one <laughs> believes that no because <laughs> winnipeg is is not big it's uh it's no amsterdam he's won the speedy house of ill repute <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I never got to talk to my granny about that. But she, um, anyway, she also moves over to London. She also reinvents herself to an extent. And she gets to know Bill Stevenson in the 1930s. And here are these, these two Canadians who both come from the same part of the world. They get to know each other. They become friends. And, um, and one day she takes my three-year-old dad over to go and see Bill Stevenson. And they have, um, they have lunch, um, after lunch, maybe they sort of had quite a, a heavy lunch, who knows. But after lunch, she kind of goes to sleep. And then Bill wakes her up and says, by the way, um, where's your three-year-old son, a.k.a. my dad? And, and she says, I've got no idea. He then sprints over to the other side of the house where there is an enormous pond covered in water lilies. And the story I remember hearing as I grew up was was slightly different every time. I mean, the most dramatic version is that that my dad is is drowned and Stevenson dives in fully clothed and fishes him out from the bottom of the pond and and resuscitates him. In a slightly sort of milder version, dad is just sort of beginning to walk in and Stevenson grabs him. Either way, the story was that he saved my dad's life mm. and he then became my dad's godfather, I think, on the strength of, of this, of the, the pond incident. And there is this moment then, I always knew that my, my granny had gone off to America shortly before Pearl Harbor. And I knew that she was a public speaker. I knew she was a campaigner. And I told my dad that I was beginning to write this book. And there was almost this sort of film-like moment of him saying, well, I haven't really got anything about her. I wish I knew more. Apart from this one box, and then produces this enormous box full of letters and diaries and the speeches that she was giving in America to 
audiences of Hollywood producers and actors to audiences of American soldiers. She did a tour of uh, of uh, army bases in the South, and um, and that was yeah, that was that was moving for me, having never understood that part of her, that she was not only an amazing speaker, but also brave, um, incredibly brave to to give those talks in the way that she did because they're they're bullish, they're strong, they're kind of they're they're saying you know I, I understand why you don't want to come into the war, but you have to. And this is why. And if you don't, this is what's going to happen. And essentially, I found evidence of, of her being in touch with Bill Stevenson and Bill Stevenson giving her guidance as to where she should go to give these talks and helping to, to pave the way for this, this to happen. This is in October, November 1941. So there is, it's not a huge part of the story, but it, it certainly kind of lends a personal element to it because I can imagine her giving these talks and I guess I mean, the one thing it illustrates in the historical sense is that Stevenson was willing to throw everything at this problem mm-hmm. even a Canadian journalist friend who he had from London who happened to be a good public speaker even getting her to give talks in individual U.S. barracks that's the um that's how far he was willing to go it's it's such an intimate connection for you as an author and, and I know that when when anybody sits down to write, to put a narrative arc together, there, there, there's kind of an intimation of, oh, I know where I'm going with this story. I'll see where it will take me. Did it make it harder or easier to actually be objective about the story you were putting together? To, in a strange way, it made it easier. And maybe this says more about me. I'm so, so desperate whenever I think I have some kind of bias, I'll go too far in the other direction to try and overcome it. And... Um, and so in that sense, I almost kind of go out of my way to, to talk about Stevenson's flaws and his weaknesses. Oh, and by the way, if he hadn't done that, I, I wouldn't be alive if he hadn't saved my dad's life. So I w- wanted to overcome that debt in some ways by, by making sure I didn't just present him in this sort of hagiographical manner. Yeah. And I guess one of the other things it does is that it, it just brings all of those characters that much closer. If I'm reading about my granddad's going out and, and sort of getting drunk with Bill Steams. And then I, I feel as though I feel as though I can understand who this person was. It makes me feel more intimate with him. And, and I guess historically, that's what you're always trying to do to get as close as you can to people who are otherwise perforce distant. And so I think it's more of a help than a hindrance, but I was definitely aware of how it could have been a hindrance. So mine is far more rope, uh, ropey than that. Mine is James McCudden. And it's the fact that he was uh, a bit of a lad with all the dancing girls in London. Mm. And that I know my great nan, Doris, was uh, a tiller girl at the London Palladium during World War One. Right. So in my head, there was at the very least a flirtation <laughs> at some point between my great gran and James <laughs> McCudden, the pilot. Meryn, have you got one? No. <laughs> 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 my, my oh, no, I live in the middle of nowhere in Norfolk. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm living vicariously through other people's legacies and dreams, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, oh, thank you so much. This has been outstanding. Merrin, is there anything else you want to get to before we yeah. let go? Just, just, just one thing. I mean, Stevenson, as far as I, I know, he asked to be buried secretly, didn't he? He, he was mm. a bit of a man of mystery towards the end of his life. Mm. Is there... It, it is such an incredible story. Is there any chance that we would see this perhaps interpreted on the screen? <sighs> there was. The book was optioned by... I mean, had you asked me this question about four months ago, I, you would have got a rapturous response. It's been optioned by the people who made Normal People Element Pictures, and it's going to be amazing. And they've got meetings with the script writers, and they've got a director who's loosely attached... And, and the reality of television kicks in. Then they dropped it. So um, that's if it is going to happen, it's not going to happen with them. And Damn. hopefully we'll get optioned again by someone else. Well, uh, Alex is yeah. about to go and buy lottery tickets. So you <laughs> <laughs> call, okay? You're on. Director, right. producer, writer, jointly, it's, it's done. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute privilege to listen to you. And just in case anybody doesn't, know what your dad did as well it is well worth going and looking up where your father has been (laughs) and the impact of bill stevenson picking him up out of the weeds has been um 
well, it's, it, there's been quite an impact and certainly some of the other books and I'm holding them up here of yours that I've read I think we've all got a debt of credit to the man <laughs> thank you that's a lovely thing to hear thank you Henry. really good to talk thanks guys brilliant and we will of course put your book on our bookshop.org page uh, just visit that and you can not only support Henry uh, and not support Amazon but you can support History Hack because apparently they give us a cut for every book we sell so if you would like to read Our Man in New York fabulous story of Bill Stevenson off you go don't forget that we do exist on Patreon as History Hack and on Patreon as well, which is Podbean's own version. Uh, Alina and I have had massive fun doing this in 2020, uh, but life's going to change quite a lot next year and we're going to actually have to go and earn a living, etc. If we want to keep up the regularity that we've been bringing you and the kind of guests that we've been bringing you and the workload, then we will need your help. So uh, if you join... There's going to be incentives for joining on either of those platforms. We're revamping ourselves on both of them. So don't forget to go in. You can do as little as a dollar a month and it all goes towards keeping up History Hack as regular as we've been able to bring it to you this year. When our guests join us to talk about their work and their new book, the 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts. So to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them, and you can support History Hack too. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash hack history, or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. Thank you for your continued support, and here's to your next great book.